Welcome to the church. I'm Brittany, where our vision is to build a church for God around the presence of God. Our prayer is that this word aligns you with God, connects you in your daily experience with Him as we advance the kingdom. As this word encourages you, we hope that you will subscribe, like, comment, and share on all of our platforms. If you have your Bibles, I want you to please open them up to the book of 1 Chronicles chapter 4. And we're going to be reading in verse 10. And as custom in the house, we stand for the reading of God's word. So 1 Chronicles 4 and 10. I'll be reading out of the New King James Version. Uh, I hope they have that one up for me. Yes, they did. All right. Awesome. So glad to see you all. Glad you are here. If you're joining us for the first time, we welcome you. Our vision here is to build a church for God around the presence of God. We do that by aligning you through God's word, connecting you with other believers, and then advancing you into your God-given purpose. That's how we do it. That's how we obtain the vision. Let's read together 1 Chronicles 4 and 10. God's word says, Jabez cried out to the God of Israel, Oh, that you would bless me indeed and enlarge my territory. There's an exclamation point right there, which means he says, enlarge my territory. Let your hand be with me and keep me from harm so that I will be free from pain. And the Bible says, and God granted his request. We're going to be starting a series, Prayer Pace. For this is the year of the pace setter. And if you're going to be a pace setter for Jesus, then you better have a prayer pace. Let's pray. Father, this is your word. I'm not here to alter it, Lord. I'm not here, Lord God, to interrupt what you want to say. I'm here merely as a vessel, as your chosen ambassador to preach and teach to your people. I only ask, Lord, that you be lifted up and that you draw all men unto you. In Jesus' name we pray and all of God's people say, amen. You may be seated. Amen. Wow, excited to be back. Took a month off sabbatical. I was on that front row every single Sunday cheering on every voice. Can we give it up for all of those who preached and taught during the month of July? Wow. Amen. So we read in this story here in 1 Chronicles 4 and 10 about a man named Jabez. Jabez is a man that's only mentioned here in the book of First Chronicles, in the middle of a genealogy, y'all. In the middle of a genealogy, right? The writer of First Chronicles stopped to give uh, special recognition to this man who seemed to have an exceptional relationship with God. And we know this because God's word is God-inspired which means God inspired men to write down his words. God breathed onto these pages from his perspective. So we know that Jabez, he had to have been someone noteworthy. According to who? To God. And for what? Specifically for his prayer posture. Because there's no other mention of Jabez in the Bible. No other mention of him building great cities. No other mention of him, you know, restoring things. No other mention of him healing somebody, laying hands on somebody, casting a demon out. No, we only know Jabez for one thing, for his prayer posture. I have come to believe that Jabez, he had God's attention because of his prayer life. The prayer of Jabez, it is a powerful fourfold prayer that we're going to dive into this month. If you're going to have a prayer posture, church, or what I like to call for this series this month, a prayer pace, I would suggest that you imitate Jabez. I mean, this is the year of the pace setter. First, Chronicle, First Corinthians 11 and 1 says, imitate me as I imitate Christ. So we're supposed to imitate those who are following Christ. We're supposed to follow Jesus and imitate those who are following him as well. Jabez was a man who followed God. If you want to have a prayer pace, I would highly suggest that you imitate the prayer of Jabez. To have a prayer pace like Jabez, God has to have all of your heart, church. 
God is looking intently at your heart to see if you really want what he wants for your life. As a pace setter for Jesus, you should have a prayer pace. A prayer pace consists of really on, only one thing. Are you ready? It's not a lot. Your heart. A heart after God. When you have a heart after God, I'm here to tell you, God will not withhold anything from you because he knows your heart's intention. He knows your heart is not selfish. He knows your heart is not vain or conceited or hateful or vengeful or any of these other negative things. He knows that your heart is simply turned towards him. When you have the right heart posture, that means that you should have the right prayer pace. And if you have the right prayer pace, you should be an example of a godly pace setter. A prayer pace is what is going to keep your heart turned towards God. A prayer pace is what is going to keep you imitating Jesus that ready others can follow. Others can imitate. Come on. We were up here and I saw Michael lifting up her hands. She don't just do this at home. Oh, last night we were in the tub. I was giving her her tub and, and, and we do this birthday party thing. We do with all her little animals. And it's always giraffe's birthday. Always giraffe's birthday. And we do this thing. And before we sing, I, I, I do this. All right, one and a two. And we're going to sing happy birthday to giraffe with all the animals. And then she just, last night she says, hold on, wait, God. Wait, wait, daddy. I want to pray. I want to pray for giraffe. And she prayed, dear God. I love how she says God. Dear God. See, church, do you want your children to imitate you? Some of them are. I'm going to be honest. Some of them are imitating the things that you don't like. So if you want them to imitate the things that you want them to imitate, well, then be more like Jesus. Be more like Jesus every day. Have a heart posture after God. Come on, church. If your heart is right, then you can pray the prayer of Jabez and have it effective. Watch that in your pace setting for Jesus. What the Lord is trying to teach you today is simple. Have the right heart posture as you pray the prayer of Jabez. Because right out of the gate, you hear a phrase from this prayer that it sounds selfish. Oh, that you would bless me indeed. But I assure you that that is far from the truth. See, when you have the right heart posture, I've come to prophesy. God can trust you with your requests in order to get the selfish misconception out of this phrase as you begin to pray the prayer of Jabez. You have to understand, church, why you are asking God to bless you and with what you are asking him to bless you with. This has been the discussion on our men's Marco Polo platform. Why do you want God to bless you? And with what do you, God, do you want God to bless you with? If you are asking God to bless you according to the heart posture of Jabez, it's because you know that whatever God chooses to bless you with, you're going to be content with it. Once you understand contentment in the Lord, I'm here to tell you, then you can pray the prayer of Jabez. And you can say, oh, that you would bless me indeed, because you know you will be content with whatever he chooses to bless you with. Here's a good heart check. Are you ready? To see if you have the right heart posture. The Bible says in the latter part of Daniel 9 and 18, it says, we don't make requests of you because we are righteous. Nuh-uh. Not anything I've done. But because of why? Your great mercy. Every request that I make before God, it's because of his great mercy. It's not because of I've done anything. I'm, I'm so unqualified. I'm a mess. I'm a mess. Just ask my wife. I'm a mess. She said, amen. <laughs> Daniel 9 and 18, is that you? Do you fall into this category? Because as a pace setter for Jesus, you should. I know, I know we're going to spend some time this morning in the early part of this message 
doing some self-examination. Come on, somebody. Hopefully weeding out some stuff that's in our hearts and in our minds. Because I'm telling you, church, I have felt all week with this message that the Lord is setting you up so that moving forward, you can have an effective prayer pace. Come on, church. Pace setters have an effective prayer pace. The right heart posture to ask God anything is one that knows the difference between contentment and coveting. The right heart posture knows the difference between coveting things and contentment. Church, I'm here to tell you, you were made to be content. You were not created to constantly covet what you don't have. You were created for greater things than the things that this world can offer. You were made to be content with whatever the Lord blesses you with when you seek him with the right heart posture. We talk about heart posture a lot in this church. It was just about time that I started really defining it and uh, making, allowing you to understand what it means when we say heart posture. That means my heart is turned towards God, not towards things. Here are a few quotes for you. Hopefully we'll bring some better perspective with contentment versus coveting. They're, they're kind of funny. I, I, I liked, I enjoyed actually looking these up. Uh, here's, here's one. The biggest room in the world is the room for improvement. People live in one of two tents, content or discontent. No matter how much you agonize over the dessert menu, the moment the person beside you gets their dessert, you're going to quickly realize you made the wrong decision. The average family goal is to make as much money as they are spending. But our yearnings will always outspend our earnings. The word, I love this one, the word budget is a mathematical confirmation of our suspicions. Just when you think you're going to make ends meet, someone moves the ends. I see it, I want it, I got to have it. It's a deal I just couldn't pass up. We buy things we don't need, we need we don't need with money we don't have to impress people we don't like. Look at what I bought. It was on sale. And look how much money I saved because it was on sale. Keisha and Charles, I don't know who rolled their eyes more. (laughs) But you still had to spend the money to get it. Look, they're going to send you coupons constantly. Constantly. Today is chicken day. Get a buy one, get one free. Yeah, but you still have to buy the chicken to get the free one. Come on, church. 52 easy payments. I'm here to tell you, there is no such thing as easy payments. If it were easy, pay cash. And then you won't have to worry about all that, all that interest you're racking up. Come on, that's easy. That's the easy. There are three groups of people. The haves, the have-nots, and the haves, but have not paid for what they have. We need to treat debt and credit with extreme caution. When it comes to buying something new, we need to take inventory of what we've already got. Some of us need to have some plastic surgery. We need to cut up our plastic credit cards. Here's a good one. I'm going to leave you with this one. Use it up. Wear it out. Make it do or do without. Come on, church. Let's say it together. I think we, I think some good class participation today. Ready? Here we go. Ready? Use it up. Wear it out. Make it do or do without. 
Come on, church. You know, I, I give you these quotes because I feel it necessary that if you want to have the right prayer pace, well, you better know where your heart is. If you're going to align yourself with God's word and with the prayer of Jabez, you better understand what you are asking, what you are asking God when you say, oh, that you would bless me indeed. This is not a selfish prayer. In fact, if you have the right heart posture, this is the uh, very selfless prayer because God knows your heart's intention. Here's, here's the thing. One of the top ten commandments, is it is still vital to follow today, and it's found in Exodus chapter 20, verse 17. And in the King James Version, my son Samson, he has it memorized. A lot of these scriptures that I, I'm, I'm quoting, uh, Samson, he has these memorized, right? And, and, and this is a particular one I love when he's, when he's saying it. Uh, it says, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife, nor his manservant, nor his maidservant, nor his ox, nor his Mercedes, nor his three-car garage, nor his corner office, nor his six-pack. Come on, somebody. Nor anything else that is thy neighbor's. I think the Bible covered it. We're not supposed to covet anything. Now, we say, well, who's your neighbor? Anyone who's around you. The word covet means to desire with intent. To own something that you could never, never say is rightfully yours. You know, the Bible has many examples of people who coveted something that they could never, never say was rightfully theirs. Lot coveted land. And when the time came for him to choose life or choose land, he still had a hard time of letting go of the wicked land. King David coveted Uriah's wife Bathsheba. Jacob coveted his brother Esau's birthright. Matthew was a tax collector, and you would think that he coveted money, but it was actually Judas who coveted those 30 pieces of silver when he betrayed Jesus. Another word for covet is materialism. Maybe this will help you. Materialism and being obsessed with things can cause great problems in our lives. If you're taking notes, you want to write this one down. Materialism can cause worry. When we focus on things, we worry about them. We worry about getting what we want, and we worry about losing what we have. Money is one of the greatest worries of most people. If we declare to God, oh, that you would bless me indeed, our heart posture should not be one that says, oh, I'm worried if God doesn't bless me right. That's the wrong heart posture, church. Here's another one. Materialism can cause weariness. There's a story of a wise king and an ungrateful peasant. You see, the ungrateful peasant, he stood before the wise king, complaining about how he felt his life had turned out, how he felt that if he had more, that he'd be more grateful and that he'd be more happy. So the wise king said to the peasant, you know, I can help you out with this problem. Here's my suggestion. You can have as much of my land as you can walk off in a day, as much as you can walk around. So early the next day, that peasant got up, and he started walking, and he was walking, and he was so excited. He was so excited about everything he was going to inherit. He was so motivated by what he could inherit if he would not stop. So he walked, and he walked. He didn't stop to rest. He didn't stop to eat or drink anything. He walked and walked, con just totally consumed with inheriting as much as he could. And you know what? By the, before the end of the day, he collapsed and he died. And you want to know how much he inherited? Six feet. Six feet under. Church, if you are so consumed, if you are so consumed, church, so consumed with things, it's causing you to grow weary. You've heard it taught in the church, it's okay to get weary. 
We all get weary, but it's not okay, according to Galatians 6 and 9, to grow weary in our well-doing. And I've come to declare that materialism, it is not well-doing. So if you are growing weary, chasing after things, buddy, it's because you are chasing the wrong thing. We lose our health trying to gain our wealth. And then we'll spend our wealth trying to gain back our health. Come on, church. Here's another one. Materialism, it can cause gloom. The Bible says in Psalm 1 and 2 in the King James Version, we're talking about the blessed man. So if you read uh, Psalm, if you read Psalm 1, it's talking about the blessed man in the first part of this. And it says, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law doth he meditate, watch, day and night. The blessed man is constantly thinking on God's word, constantly meditating in God's word. God's word gives him delight, and it is that delight that causes him to be blessed. If you are so consumed with materialism, then you aren't meditating in God's word. You are constantly chasing after things, and in the process, I'm here to tell you, church, it is stealing your joy. Here's a hint. The thing about winning the rat race is that if you win in the end, you're still a rat. If you don't have everything, you need to learn to make the best of everything, church, that you do have. Now, I want to make it clear. I want to make it clear. I don't want anyone walking out of here twisted, all right? The Bible doesn't condemn wealth or possessions. The Bible doesn't say that money is evil. But it does say that the love of money is the root of all evil. Another way to put it is God is not opposed to wealth, but he is opposed to the worship of wealth. See, in 16 out of 38 parables, Jesus taught about money and possessions. In Mark chapter 10, if you want to go there, Mark chapter 10, starting in verse 23, and I'm reading out of the NIV. This is what Jesus taught. Mark 10 and 23. It says that Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, how hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God! Exclamation point. Verse 24, the disciples were amazed at his words. But Jesus said again, children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. I'm going to stop right there. When Jesus has to repeat himself, It's because he's trying to get our attention. Continue. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. Now, I know that many have explained this example by using an actual needle used for sewing. But to really grasp What Jesus was saying here, you you have to put yourself back in Jesus' time. When you do that, it's a very simple analogy that anyone can grasp. You see, church, Jesus taught in parables so that it wouldn't go over people's heads, but so that it would hit them right between the eyes. You see, the eye of the needle was in reference to a narrow gateway into Jerusalem. Can, can they put that up for me, that picture? I don't know if they got that picture of that. Beautiful. Look at that. You see this camel right here? This camel, he's big already, and he's got a load on, but now he's dragging a load with him. And on top of the load, he's got someone who's driving the camel. This load is wide. It looks heavy. It looks pretty hard to manage in tight quarters, right? So when Jesus was describing to the people about how it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle, it's easier for this camel to go through a narrow gateway in Jerusalem. Church, what was Jesus saying? It's easier for this camel to go through than for a a rich man to go to heaven in order for the wealthy to make it to heaven. What was Jesus saying? Since camels were heavily loaded with goods and riders, they would need to be unloaded in order to pass through. 
So the analogy is that rich man would have to similarly unload his material possessions in order to enter heaven. Church, it's not that wealthy people can't go to heaven or for that matter be saved. But in order to be saved and in order to make it to heaven, church, you have to be willing to let go of everything when God asks you. When he asks you. When he asks you. Oh, I can tell you right now, he's asked a lot out of me and Brittany. We thought he asked a lot out of us before we launched this church. Oh, no. no. <laughs> he's been asking. And he never stops because he wants to make sure the heart is turned towards him. Come on, church. Things, 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 things can't have your heart. Only Jesus can. It's not that God doesn't want you to be rich. On the contrary, he's trying to make you more rich than you've ever been. But not according to the world's standards. According to heaven's standards. I'm going to wreck some of you. I heard a quote once. If you don't want me preaching a prosperity gospel, well, then do you want me preaching a poverty gospel? Here's my answer. I don't want you preaching either one. Listen, church, I want you to preach the gospel. I'm not here. I'm sorry. I'm not here to preach a prosperity gospel. And why? Because there's no such thing. I'm not here to preach a healing gospel. Why? There's no such thing. I'm not here to preach a revival gospel. Why? There's no such thing. Why? Because there is only the gospel, church. It's just the gospel. You have to accept all of it. In it is full of God's, watch this, promises of prosperity, promises of healing, promises of revival. And that is what we preach and teach in this church. The gospel of what? Jesus Christ. See, Romans 10, 17 says it like this. So faith comes from hearing. And hearing the good news about Jesus. Faith can't come by just hearing about prosperity. No. Your faith is not going to come just by hearing about healing. Your faith is not going to come just by constantly hearing about revival. Faith comes by hearing constantly all the word of God. I'll tell you, I, I say confidently that he is, he is not done blessing me. God has blessed me in more ways than I can recount. Psalm 40 and 5 seems to be the anthem of my life. Many, O oh Lord my God, are the wonders you have done. Is that your anthem? That you can't even recount them? I can say confidently he's not done blessing me. There is more to come. If, come on somebody, if I will continue to posture my heart towards him. Church, there's only one way to get into heaven. His name is Jesus. That's it. You can't buy your way in. You can't bargain or barter your way in. Jesus is the only way. So if you want to get to heaven, then you better start getting more of Jesus in your life than more of the stuff that you can't take with you or use to get in. Have you ever seen a U-Haul in a funeral procession? Take a picture if you do. Coveting is a dangerous sin. That's why it's one of the top 10. And I've got news. Coveting can keep you from obtaining eternal life. You will covet everything else, most of which you don't need to live, instead of receiving the free gift of salvation that you need to live. And if you're going to Pray the prayer of Jabez and ask God, oh, that you would bless me indeed. You need to make sure that your heart does not covet and your heart, it does not delight in materialism. Pastor Sonny, why are we talking about this? Because aren't we supposed to be talking about the blessings of God? The church, because in order to ask God to bless you, your heart has to be right. Because if you even want to start with this prayer, if you want to run out of the gate and say, oh, that you would bless me, your heart has to be right. That's why I'm trying to get you to get your heart postured towards him so that your prayers will be effective. 
Come on, church. The opposite of coveting is the principle of being content. And this is where the prayer of Jabez finds its effectiveness. One of the greatest ways to combat coveting is through contentment. The Bible teaches us in 1 Timothy 6, and if you want to go there, 1 Timothy chapter 6, we're going to be starting in verse 6. I know you, some of you are here for the first time and you hear Bibles. Yeah, we I actually challenged the people many months ago. Bring your Bibles because I want you to get it, look at it, see it in your version, highlight it. You go home, you know, put a crinkle in it. You go back and study it. Uh, 1 Timothy chapter 6, starting in verse 6. This is how we combat coveting. This is how do we combat coveting. 1 Timothy 6, starting in verse 6. Here we go. Es cierto que con la verdad... Verdadera religión se obtienen grandes ganancias. How's my Spanish? Could do some work, right? But godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into the world and we can take nothing out of it. But if we have food and clothing, we will be content with that. Those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Some people eager for money have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. Verse 11. But you, you, man of God, women of God, flee from all of this and pursue what? Pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, and gentleness. You got to fight the good fight of faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called. Come on, you were called when you made your good confession in the presence of many witnesses in the sight of God who gives life to everything and of Christ Jesus. Jesus, who will testify, he, he will testify before Pontius Pilate, uh, how he testified before Pontius Pilate made the good confession, I charge you to keep this command without spot or blame until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. Come on, church, give God praise in this place for his word. That's how you combat coveting is you remind the devil what the Bible says about coveting. God made everything. God made that. God gave me that. I'm going to say it till I see it. When I see it, I will say it. I'll say, God did that. God made that. God gave me the promotion. God made a way when it didn't seem one. God provided the, the finances. God made a way to pay the mortgage. God made a way for my child to not be consumed with medication in order to sit still in the classroom. God did that. No, no, no. You, you didn't do that, and you didn't do that, and that, no. God did that. God made everything. I'm here to declare that God wants to bless those whose heart is content in the Lord. I'm here to declare that God is not interested in hoarding his children with stuff. He's interested in blessing his children with so much more than we can even imagine or think according to Malachi 3 and 10. Why, church, do we limit God to stuff when the blessings of God account for far greater than material things. The best way to be content is to count your blessings, not your cash. And you may not have a lot of cash, but I assure you, you got tons of blessings. How do I know that? Because you are sitting in here and not lying in some hospital on life support. Come on, somebody. If you know your heart is postured towards God, give God a praise in this place right now. How grateful you are. How grateful you are. He woke you up this morning. He called you this morning. He separated you this morning. He didn't let it overtake you last night. Come on, somebody. He didn't let it take you out. Come on, somebody. If you're still breathing, God still has a purpose for your life. Be content in the fact that he has called you. Be content the fact you are still breathing. Be content the fact you still have an assignment. 
Come on, somebody. We need to be aware. We need to be aware of this when and then thinking. When and then thinking. When I get my dream house, then I'll be happy. When I, when I graduate from college, then I'll have it all. When I get married, then it'll make sense. When, when my children grow up and grow out of the house, then I've arrived. Come on. When I have more. When I have what they have. When, 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 I, when I find the relationship I've been looking for, when I find the friends I've been looking for, when I find the church I've been looking for, when, when, come on, church, when, then I'll be happy. Then I'll be satisfied. Then I'll be content. Then I'll be happy. Come on, this when and then thinking is taking away your joy right now. When and then thinking will rob you of living life. It will rob you of the now season. It will rob you of the now season. It will rob you of what God is doing in your life right now, how he is what? He is molding you, and he is stretching you and helping you to set the right pace for the rest of your life. When and then thinking will rob you of the proper prayer, prayer pace to keep in stride with the now blessings of God. It's a story of a farmer who lived on a farm all his life, Worked hard on the farm all his life. Was diligent. Worked hard, though. Worked very hard and was finally ready for retirement. Finally ready for the easy life. Finally ready for the blessings. Um, I've worked hard on this farm. I've worked hard on this land. And now it's time to retire. So he decided to sell everything so he could find the finer things in life. So he called a real estate agent to come over and write for him, you know, uh, uh, an ad in the paper, right? So the real estate agent came over and helped him out, wrote an ad, and then it was finished. So he went ahead and he read back to the farmer this ad. It said this, ideal location, acres of fertile ground, beautiful livestock, barns, a gorgeous home place, streams, ponds, rivers. The farmer interrupted him, stop, I've changed my mind. I've been looking for a place like this. Church, here are some statistics for you. If you've got food, clothes, and a roof over your head, I tell you, you are richer than 75% of the world, people in the world today. If you have savings of money in your account, you are in the top 8% of the world's wealthy today. If you woke up this morning with your health, you are more blessed than 1 million people that will not survive this week. If you have not experienced the agony of torture or the pains of starvation, you are more fortunate than 500 million people in the world today. My question to you, church, the Holy Spirit's question to you, church, do you have an attitude of gratitude? The person whose prayer pace consists of, oh, that you would bless me indeed, has an attitude of gratitude. Because their heart is grateful for what God has already blessed them with. And God knows that they will continue to be grateful all the more he blesses them. God, church, he is a heart God. God blesses those whose heart is postured towards him. I'm here to tell you, church, God loves a cheerful heart. You can't be a cheerful giver if you don't have a cheerful heart. Tracy, when you stood up, God told me to tell you, be easy, my child. Be easy, my child. I'm molding you. I'm molding you. I don't hold it against you. I'm molding you. I'm shaping you. You're in my hands. You're on the potter's wheel. I'm shaping you. A prayer pace does not consist of this win and then attitude. In your prayer pace, you should be able to say, God, if you don't bless me with another thing, I'm going to praise you anyway. Come on, church. 
Oh, it's, it's cute and sexy to say, God, if you don't bless me with another thing, I'm going to praise you anyway. Oh, you got to say that in the middle of your stuff and situation. You got to stand up in the middle of that crisis, in the middle of that pain, in the middle of that loss, in the middle of worry, in the middle of frustration. And you got to stand up, get your knickers up, and you got to say, God, if you don't bless me, you, I, I will still praise you. Let the devil hear you. Let the devil hear you shout. Let him hear you see your grateful heart. Let the devil see you. I'll praise you anyway, God. I'll praise you. You've been good, too good, too good. I didn't deserve it. You're too good. Woo. Woo. Come on, church. Are you ready, though? Are you ready? Are you ready? Are you ready? Are you ready? Here's the thing. Here's the thing. You, you stand up and say that. Are you ready for God's response? Oh, I hope they ask me to bless them. Because that's the kind of pace setter I've been looking to bless. That's the one I'm looking to bless. The one who says, I'll praise you anyway. The one who's in the middle of the mess, I'll praise you. I can't wait. Say it. Uh, just say it. Uh, just say it. Just say it. You got to open up your mouth, church, and you got to say it. Why? Because there are two people who are listening, the devil and God. And then devil has a prediction, but God knows the end from the beginning. Come on, Come on church. God says, when you open up your mouth and say that, oh, I can't wait. I can't wait to bless you. Why? Because God's a heart God. He's a heart God. He's a heart God. A pace setter for Jesus with a prayer pace that asks God, oh, that you would bless me indeed. They know this. They know this. They know that money can buy medicine, but it cannot buy health. Money can buy a house, but it cannot buy a home. Money can buy companionship, but it cannot buy friendship. Money can buy entertainment, but it cannot buy joy. Money can buy food, but it cannot buy an appetite. Money can buy a bed, but it cannot buy sleep. Money may, may be able to buy a crucifix, but it cannot buy a savior. Savior. The prayer pace of a Holy Ghost filled pace setter says, Money is good, <laughs> but God is great and He is worthy to be praised. Money ate everything, haha, <laughs> but Jesus is. This is the day to be joyful. One day you're going to look back, church, on this day and you'll say, those were the good old days when I was grateful and I didn't have much, but I was grateful anyway. Can we give God praise for the good old days right now? Because you're going to need to remind yourself of the good old days. Watch is falling off. Oh, Jesus. Ecclesiastes 5 and 10 in the NLT says this. Ecclesiastes 5 and 10 in the NLT says, those who love money will never have enough. How meaningless to think that wealth brings true happiness. That's what the Bible says. I'm here to tell you that wealth does not bring true happiness. Robin Williams was wealthy. Brittany Murphy was wealthy. Alvis Presley was wealthy. Heath Ledger was wealthy. Liberace was wealthy. Michael Jackson was wealthy. Whitney Houston was wealthy. And yet every one of these wealthy people died unhappy. Things satisfy for a while but then they lose their thrill. You know what I liken? I liken things and possessions that we're eager to have. I liken it to waiting in the ride lines at Disneyland. So you spend more time in the line than on the ride. You spend more time trying to get things than you do enjoying them. You'll spend all your life trying to get it, trying to get it, and then when you get it, your life's over. I tell you right now, no, no, I'm not going to go there. I stick to the stick. Yes, I know, Lord. I know. He's telling me, stick. I know. Okay. 
Proverbs 18.11 in the message says this. I love this one. Proverbs 18.11 in the message says this. The rich think their wealth protects them. They imagine themselves safe behind it. I like to say that with a little attitude. I just do. I like to say it with a little attitude. God does not want us trusting in things. God wants us trusting in him, church. The right prayer pace keeps us trusting in the Holy Spirit to, gr- to guide our every intention, especially when it comes to the blessings of God. Did you know that you are one little vein in your brain from collapsing dead from an aneurysm? Your safety is not in your money. It's not in your house. It's not in your accumulation of things or your accomplishments, your degrees. Come on. Your titles. Come on. Our safety is in the fact that he will never leave us and he will never forsake us according to Hebrews 13 and 5. Our safety is in the fact that he will supply all of our needs according to Philippians 4.19. Come on, church. His word is a wall of safety for my life. His promises through his word can be a wall of safety for your life. Security and happiness cannot be bought. As one philosopher once said, I can't get no satisfaction because I tried and I tried and I tried and I tried, but I can't get no satisfaction. Come on, church. How many of you know only Jesus can satisfy your soul? So here's a greater revelation of the prayer of Jabez. When we ask God, oh, that you would bless me indeed. Are you ready? Because this is the part I've been really excited to get to. You know, the first part is, 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 the, come, is coming and, and teaching and teaching and trying to get your heart posture. Because when you get your heart postured right, then it can get to the good part. Are you ready? When you have a prayer pace like that of Jabez, and when you ask God to bless you, God knows the person who is asking for the blessing. He knows you. He knows you. He knows your heart is postured, not asking God to hoard you with things. He knows you are asking him to do a greater work in your life so that you can turn around, watch this, and be a blessing to others. He knows that you are putting no limitations on the blessings of God. He knows that in your heart you are telling him, God, there are no limits to how you can bless me because you know what I will do with your blessings. I'm going to use it to bring you honor and glory. 2 Corinthians 9 and 11 in the NIV says this, you will be enriched in every way so that why? So that you can hoard So you can be generous on what? Every occasion. And through us, your what? Your generosity. What's it going to result in? What's it going to result in? What's it going to result in? In thanksgiving to God. When you have a prayer pace like Jabez, you know your prayer is not about possessions. It is about people. God's people. If we are not careful, we can covet so much that things become more important to us than people. Possessions cannot compensate for successful relationships. Come on, somebody. Acts 20 and 35, if they can pull that up for me. Acts 20 and 35 in the New King James Version says this. I have shown you in every way by laboring like this that you must support the weak. And remember the words of the Lord Jesus that he said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. And who are we giving to? God's people. And who are God's people? Everyone. And who are the weak? Well, one way to look at it are those without Jesus as their Lord and Savior. Luke 12 and 15 in the NIV says this, Luke 12 and 15, if they can pull that up. Then he said to them, watch out. Be on your guard against all kinds of greed. Life does not consist in an abundance of possessions. I'm here to tell you that praying for blessings with the intent of greed, it's not living an abundant life, church. It's living a greedy life. God can't trust greedy people. 
You hear that? God can't trust greedy people or stingy. I like stingy people. Come on. 2 Corinthians 10.18. I love this one. 2 Corinthians 10.18 says this. For it's not the one who commends, or another word for commends is entrusts. For it's not the one who entrusts himself who is approved. Watch this. But the one whom what? The Lord commends or entrusts. God says, God says, I can't trust. No, 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 no. I'm the one. I'm the one. When they brought all of, they brought all of the sons before the prophet, and Samuel looked, and he said, surely, God, this is the one. Nope. No, that's not the one. That's not the one. That's not the one. That's not the one. There's no more. Is there one? Yeah, he's out in the field. But he's just a shepherd boy. But you know what the shepherd boy was doing? He was worshiping God. He was the one closest to God. He was the one who had a heart for God's people. Come on, church. Come on, church. According to Scripture, we just read in Luke 12, 15, a man's life does not consist in the abundance of things because the abundance of things should not define a person's life. His heart posture towards God should. Striving for riches, it can cost you your marriage. And if you have kids, it can cost you your relationship with your children. I'm here to tell you, church, the best thing, the best thing, hear me, the best thing you can give to your spouse is your time. The best thing you can give to your children is presence, not presence. The right prayer pays us to God. I'm going to love people and use things. I'm not going to use people and love things. Church, you got to keep your focus on God's people, not on possessions. You know, the other day, my son Samson asked me, we were eating dinner. He asked me an honest question. He says, Daddy, do you want to be rich? And I got to be honest, I have thought about that question for weeks. I thought about this question, going over it. Here's my final answer. Remember that game show? Is this your final answer? Yeah, all week, for weeks, I was thinking about that question. Here's my final answer. You bet I do. I want God to bless me indeed, but not according to the world standards, according to God's riches and glory. I want to be blessed so I can be a blessing to others. Every pace setter should want to be rich with God's blessings, but not the way that this world thinks. But so that God will what? Get all the honor and all the glory. That's what we mean when we say, I'm going to say it till I see it. And when I see it, I will say it. I'm going to say, God did that. I'm not going to say that I did that or I made that happen, but God made all those things happen. I'm a blessed, I'm blessed to be a blessing. You need to look beyond what's temporal if you're going to be content. That's what the problem, what was a problem with the rich man. He was too focused on what he had instead of what he could have had. Because if you can't take, if, take, take care of the temporal blessings, then how, church, are you going to take care of the eternal ones? Mark 8.36, the NIV says, For what is a prophet of man to gain the whole world and yet forfeit his own soul? See, because, church, if you live for just the here and now, You're going to be a miserable person. You need to live with the mindset of eternity, storing up treasures in heaven. I'm going to close with this. When you pray, oh, that you would bless me indeed. Do you know why Jabez ended with that phrase, indeed? I love the conversation we had on Marco about this. See, the word indeed, it means with emphasis. I don't want you to bless me, ordinary God, but I want your supernatural blessings, the blessings that only you can provide. The word indeed, it means surprisingly. I don't want you to bless me with just what I think I need, Lord. But I want you to surprise me. Because after all, you know the end from the beginning. You know what I really need. You know how this thing turns out. The word indeed, it also means, I love this one, without question. 
Do you know why God can bless you when your heart is postured right? It's because there is no question what he knows what you're going to do with it. He doesn't have to question you about it. He doesn't have to keep questioning you about it. He doesn't have to question you about it. That if you ask him to bless me indeed, he doesn't have to question about what you're going to do with him. It's not like having an Anna Dalvey conversation with God. I don't understand why you're asking me all these questions. No, God says I'm going to bless you. There's no question about it because I know your heart. I know where you are. I know your posture. I know you. I see you. I see you when no one else sees you. Church, I'm here to tell you when God blesses you indeed there is no question about your intention he knows your heart the world may question you and they may be jealous about you but there is no question about your heart intention with God he knows your heart he can't wait to bless you indeed thank you so much for joining us here today we pray that you were blessed and stretched by today's word maybe you need a prayer or have a question for us here at the church Make sure to fill out our contact form on our website at thechurchphx.com and stay connected with us on our Instagram and Facebook at The Church PHX. We look forward to seeing you next Sunday at our 10 a.m. Sunday experience, either in person or online. And remember, we are the church, building a church for God around the presence of God. 